Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode. And this episode is gonna be a frustrating pottery episode. <laughs> We're done with the scut. Yeah. She had to hide because, you know, my lips, it'll be a naughty word. Monsters. Mm -hmm. nah. Might get fired. Administration <laughs> might see this, who knows. You're in my own uh, self-employment. We are trying to adjust Kara's scut kiln because the last several firings, it's been firing very hot. So she's been experimenting with different things. We tried looking online for a solution. There's nothing online. There's nothing on YouTube. There's nothing at Scut that we can find. That we can find because we thought we could recalibrate or calibrate the thermal couple in there, but it's like, no, you don't get to do that. So our idea is we are planning to just do a normal cone six firing empty with some shelves in there because Kara's kiln has three zones. So I'm thinking we'll have three separate shelves in there with three sets of witness cones. And then about an hour before peak temperature, we'll open up a peephole plug, see if the cone six cone is bending the way it should. Mm -hmm. And if it is, we're gonna write down the temperature that the kiln is giving us. And then at the end of the firing, when it reaches peak temperature, we're gonna subtract those two temperature numbers and then that will be our difference. So even if the kiln is saying that it's firing at a perfect cone six temperature, but the witness cone is saying, no, you're not, we're gonna take that into account and then fire it at the temperature we recorded when the cone was bent to see if that works. Making up for the difference. Yeah, we're making up for the difference to see if that works and we're gonna bring you along on this journey because we don't know. And you say it better than I do because I have all these dis dead these dos and ums, so. And welcome to Wisconsin. You talk more better gooder. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna show you what we have done so far in the last several firings. Okay, so little lesson on cones. Oh, you gotta give me a second. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, and Kara is going to give us a little lesson on cones. Oh, should I wear your glasses too? Oh, no, eh, I can't even read. <laughs> Sorry, the only nerd here is me. Oh, witness cones will, I believe, give you a more accurate reading than just the temperature readout on the digital interface of your kiln. So witness cones, non-self-standing cones, you usually need to put them in a holder. And then there is the first, second, and third cone. The second or middle cone, that is gonna be your optimal temperature. In our case, we're trying to shoot for a cone six. So I'm gonna have a cone six in this slot, a cone five in this slot, and a cone seven in this slot. The five should do just like the image shows where it bends a lot. The cone six should bend at almost a curvy 90 degree angle, and then the guard cone, which is a cone seven, should remain straight or slightly bent if it bends a lot. That's what's showing me that it's way too hot. For example, I've done many cone sixes and they're getting progressively hotter. This cone here isn't too bad, but when I see that the cone sevens, the guard cones, are bending quite a bit, that worries me that it's getting way too hot. When this is all the way bent over touching and these are really starting to bend, unlike the photo or unlike the drawing here, that raised a red flag for me. So when we fired at a cone six normal, it was way too hot. So then in order to fix that, what did we do? Oh, then uh, the next firing, I wanted to try a cone five firing, but I made sure that I had a load of glazeware that was very stable glazes, meaning they would turn out regardless if it got too hot or too cold. So I tried cone five just to see my difference and it was a huge difference. My middle zone, middle shelf, this is a perfect cone for a cone five, which is what I was firing at, just to try it. And then the guard cones stayed straight, but also the middle cones had barely any bend at all, which is okay for a cone five, but when the top and the bottom zones barely had any bend as well, that shows me that, okay, now I'm too cold. So before I was way too hot, now I'm too cool. So then our third attempt, I went to a cone five and a half. So after doing the one that was too cool, then I tried middle of the road between cone five and cone six, but I also put a 10 minute hold just to hold the heat a little bit longer. That was pretty well perfect for two out of the three zones to try and get to a cone six. What I mean by that is when you add a hold at the end of a cone firing, meaning it will get more heat work, 
per piece. When that happens, it retains the heat more, meaning it gets hotter and hotter and hotter until it finally reaches the peak temperature with the peak hold, in this case of 10 minutes, and then it'll kill it and then it'll start cooling down. So because of that 10 minute hold, my cone six cones bent almost perfect, but the guard cones in the middle section got a little bit too hot. And then of course my uh, cone five cones got too warm. That's expected, that's okay. Uh, the only bad thing with doing a 10 minute hold is some of my glazes don't like that. They turn scaly and dark instead of being shiny the way they should because some just don't like to be held at that high of a temperature for that long. So I wanna get away from a 10 minute hold for most of my glazes, which is why ideally I just want a straight up and down cone six which is what we're trying to figure out right now. So that's where we're at everybody. So we will do some test firings, show you the results and how we were troubleshooting those. So stay tuned. <laughs> some people that have contacted me in the past, and this is in the manual, but sometimes people's kilns don't come with a manual, but some people ask how come my um, downdraft vent isn't working very well or why is my firing off? One potential reason is they don't raise their bottom kiln shelves up off the kiln floor. Recommended in the SCUT manual is you raise these up about an inch off the kiln floor, which is why I have inch tall kiln furniture. But that will help with airflow, especially when you have a downdraft on your kiln, which this one does. And it will help with more even heating, along with keeping things away from your elements and away from the wall and split. The other thing that I wanna try that I usually do, 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 I will clean off all the fire scale that's on the thermocouple because just like the elements that gets worn after a while, if there's moisture in the kiln and I kind of do a pre-bake to drive out any moisture, some of that settles on the metal and it corrodes. So I take a wire brush and a little file and I scrub all that off and then I vacuum it up and I take the shelves off and I vacuum it up. And then I vacuum all the kiln elements and I vacuum out the peepholes just because I want to make sure it's clean because I'm fussy. That could interrupt the reading make the reading not accurate on the thermal couple? I don't know, because the thermal couple is kind of like your thermometer for the kiln. It reads out the temperature to your box, so it can tell the kiln when to get hot, when to get cold, all that good stuff. Ramble, ramble. Is the thermal couple, couple, couple easy to break? Yes, if you're klutzy like me, or you're really tired, and you're loading or unloading your kiln late at night, early in the morning, and if you bang this ceramic sheath and it breaks, replace your thermal couple because that's going to affect your readout to your control panel. Genius! Man. So we just got done loading the kiln. Yeah. When you first buy a kiln, they say fire it empty or just with enough shelves to hold cones for each section, in this case three. But since this isn't a new kiln and I don't have to burn off any residual oil on the elements, I don't like firing a kiln empty because I don't think it would give an accurate reading as far as bouncing heat around. So I put multiple levels of shelves in here, but as you can see in the playback, you usually offset the shelves unless you've got like a big bowl or a plate to fire. And what I mean by offsetting is one shelf is a little higher or lower than its neighbor. That way air has an easier time weaving in and out as it's getting pulled through the top of the kiln, down through the bottom and out through the back. And then we put cone packs on each of the sections. So I just did it by random because again, this is all educated guess we have now. So everything we're doing, we're not saying this is the exact way to do it. This is just what we think we can try. When it's firing, we should be able to look through each one of these peepholes and see the progress of the firing by looking at the witness cones. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so explain what's going on. Oh, I explained to you. So we're gonna do a regular cone six medium firing and they make it so easy. So we're gonna pretend there's glaze in there. And then we want cone six, which is high fire. And then we want medium because nothing in there is humongous. It's just kiln shelves to bounce heat. And it'll say it'll take approximately seven and a half hours to fire. Usually if it says seven and a half hours, I usually tack on an hour and a half to two hours longer. 
I don't know why. It just takes longer than it. So to make sure we have good air circulation, turn on the fan. There's three holes drilled in the lid of the kiln, and then there's three little holes that you saw in a cluster in the bottom of the kiln to make sure that you have air suction all the way through because that's a huge part of what makes the glaze do its thing. You can take a lighter and make sure the flame gets sucked down into the hole. You have that, that means that your airways are clear and you have good air circulation. And that's it. Oh, 1988. I remember that year. Oh, it's a good you year. You know why? Because we're old. So we are checking the status of the cones. I'm wearing your glasses, so. It's gonna be Roy Orbison. Oh God, they're so big. <laughs> well, they fit over my glasses. Uh, they're so big. I can't play a clarinet without my glasses. Okay, the five is moving just in here. So we're trying to see oh. all of the cones. That's so hard, that's impossible to see. We know we're early, but we just want to check because we're that way, you know. Well, if we're home to babysit it. Okay, you can see what I can see. <laughs> I'm the devil. Huh. Satan's anus. <laughs> I, I don't know what else to tell ya. So I guess it's at 1993. Checking a hundred more degrees maybe. Would that be a good plan? Uh, yeah, we could try it. Okay. We won't know until we try it. See you in a hundred degrees everybody. Yay. Five might be curving just a little. So that's what we're doing everybody just to give you an update we've come to the conclusion that the middle of the kiln is accurate temperature wise the top and the bottom zones are cool so what we are currently doing is we're checking the cones every 10 degrees to see where cone 5 actually bent and then once we have those temperatures documented we can subtract those accurate temperatures from the standard temperature of where a cone 5 is supposed to bend but we're trying to get everything accurate so we're going to subtract the actual temperature from the textbook temperature and that'll be accurate for this kiln and we'll keep you updated because we're checking it every 10 degrees it's like mm. face is so warm so the kiln's all done firing we have everything recorded as to when we saw the cones bend at to what temperature to the best of our sight. To the best of Kara's sight, anyways. You yeah. can see it. it's just a one big blob. Even with the glasses, it's one big blob. Ever see the second Indiana Jones where they're dropping the girl down into the lava? That's, That's what my face feels like. That's what Kara's face feels like, yeah. <laughs> She wouldn't drink the Kali Ma, so she has to be sacrificed. But we're gonna let it cool down for about two days, check it on Wednesday to see what the cones do after it's all done firing because... There might be a little residual heat work because even though it's falling right now, the shelves and everything still retain a lot of heat. So they may move a little bit, but I don't anticipate they're gonna move much. So we're gonna check it out and get back to you then. Okay, okay. see you later. Okay, so we just took everything out of the kiln yeah. meaning the cones and we have our so we have our notes from when we were checking it every 10 degrees when it was firing and we have the actual cones top section middle section bottom section of the kiln and that corresponds with our notes so as they were firing the top and the middle started off too cold but then as it got closer to peak temperature it got too hot whereas the bottom shelf seemed to be pretty much perfect and it actually fired a little cooler than the last time i did a cone six it looks more like the cone five and a half this is like perfect a perfect curve i kind of wish this was bent a little bit more but and that also had actual pottery in it whereas the one we tested just had shells correct what is our next plan of attack in order to calibrate the kiln to a more accurate temperature well, we're gonna look at the, what do you call it? The manual on the digital readout. Looking in the book, there's nothing really. So we're gonna figure out how to control the top two zones, top and middle, and then leave the bottom alone because that seems to be as close to a control as possible since our guard cone is pretty straight. And then I am gonna do a few of these glazed, not too much because I don't wanna sacrifice all of them if it doesn't work out. So it'll be a test run. I'll still throw some shelves in for heat bouncing around for heat work, but then we'll actually put glazed pieces in along with another set of cones, try and put them in the same spot we did before in the kiln in the bottom peephole of each section. And this time we'll just let it go. I don't think we'll babysit it because we just babysat it to get our notes. 
We're going to be doing that in another video because it's going to take a while to glaze everything and then fire it. So that will be for part two. Part one, figuring it out. So thanks for watching everybody. This has been part one of how to calibrate your kiln and understand we're experimenting because we've never done this before. So we're hoping this helps some people out on what to do if your cone's a little bit too hot or too cold. It's at least our attempt to try and figure it out. Your kiln is a little too hot or too cold, not your cone. Your kiln if it's too hot or too cold. I'm not the potter. They were cones. Mm -hmm. They were cones. So thanks for watching everybody and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.